So excited at this turnout. This is fabulous. I'm so happy to see um, all of you and some, some familiar faces and some hopefully soon to be familiar faces. I'm Megan Oakley. I teach in the library school at Syracuse University. I'm an associate professor. Uh, I used to be a coordinator of instruction at NC State Libraries, NCSC Libraries, and um, then I got my degree at Chapel Hill and turned to the dark side. So now I um, teach at LIS and, and make baby librarians, <laughs> as you <we> said. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really enjoy that phrase, but I would say that. <laughs> and I'll let my co-presenter Malcolm introduce himself. Do it now? Yeah. Sure. I'm Malcolm Brown. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm director of the Edge Dog Learning Initiative, and Art said I was director of academic putting at Dartmouth, where I work often and uh, happily with my fellow librarians. And Jennifer Taxman is right here. She can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fabulous. Okay. And I hope that uh, maybe even more people will come in. I'm excited also that the doors aren't locked anymore because I know they were locked earlier today. You get, I, I was. Um, I came down today. Uh, I have small children, and I couldn't come for the whole session. And I saw all the tweets about the excitement this morning, and I thought, Oh, they're up at four. How sad. <laughs> um, but if you're tired, so am I. So, so we can all be tired together. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about this topic. Um, I, I enjoy talking about this topic, and I hope that you guys um, will bring a lot to it. Malcolm and I are planning to talk for a little bit, just to give uh, maybe about a little half the time, or if we go over a little bit, to give a grounding. And then we really want that to become a discussion. And we really mean that. We want you guys to talk to each other, talk to the full group, and really sort of suss out some of the details of this issue, because it's, it's new territory. Uh, new technologies making, um, you know, us make new decisions, think about strategic connections with the rest of our institutions, um, and making sure that the library is at the table for these discussions, and um, uh, being a resource uh, based on our areas of expertise and also learning from others. So I'm really excited that you came today, and I want to thank you for that uh, right off the bat. I want to start by dealing with a difficult term in our title, learning analytics. I um, was talking to Malcolm about a year ago, really, um, about uh, learning analytics and what I thought uh, the future w was related to this for libraries. And our first conversation was sort of a dance around, wait, what do you mean by learning analytics? Wait, what do you mean by learning analytics? And, um, and then when we tried to talk to other people in the library community, it, it, we had the same dance. And we ended up um, really sort of understanding what we meant and then also sort of making a distinction between two likely definitions of the term. So I'm going to give like a more official definition of learning analytics in a minute, but just for the purposes of this early part of our discussion. Uh, basically when I say learning analytics, I mean using and analyzing data, usually big data, educational data, to advance student success and student outcomes. Now what that immediately put us into though was sort of navigating the territory between um, what is that and what is student learning assessment, what is that and what is maybe what we some uh, what we end up calling library analytics. So let's let's sort this out a little bit because I think if we want to have a discussion we have to kind of get on the same page. And you might not agree with my definitions but let's like try to agree with me for the purposes of the discussion. <laughs> not anything I say but just at least what we're talking about. Okay so in terms of what the definition is between this and um, uh, assessment, my background, my research area, and my teaching focuses on information literacy assessment, which I think is relevant here for student success and student learning outcomes. And if I was going to give a 30 second summary of where we've been in libraries in this territory, I would start it here. <coughs> with a long, long history of surveys getting at affect, getting at confidence level, how do you feel about um, what you've learned. Unfortunately, sometimes how do you feel about the librarian teaching it, uh, which it doesn't really get at learning, but um, is, is interesting. Then sort of I would say about a decade and a half ago, uh, there was a, a heavy emphasis on tests and a hope that we could come up with some sort of objective measure of information literacy. And then, you know, we, and that still persists. None of these things go away, ever. Nothing ever goes away. Uh, we got into sort of rubric territory, and we're going to look at artifacts of student learning, and we're going to use rubrics to try to describe what we want to see in terms of learning, articulate what it is, 
articulate how we're going to assess it, and again, that hasn't gone away either. And then I would say probably um, the last five years, this has been an area of emphasis as well. So back in 2009, Mary Ellen's in the room, so she'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, the ACRL recognized the need to help librarians articulate their value and impact, and that started off with the Value of Academic Libraries report. Um, and in that report, we defined lots of different ways to talk about value and impact. Most of them in the white are things that we have a lot of literature on or you know, a significant body of literature on. But the shift for doing the ACRL value initiative was to focus on impact of the library and defining it in terms of the goals, um, missions, and purposes of the institution and how we fill that. Not, saying that. not negating any of those other conceptions of value, but this project has really focused mostly on the library's impact on institutional goals, missions, and needs, which is rooted in our values and our beliefs about learning and about higher education. Okay, so since that time, six, almost seven years ago, um, we've added really some return on investment research and a lot of correlation, not causation, research, trying to pin down what are individual students doing in the library and what does that mean for GPA, for retention, and so on. Okay, so that's where we're, we're sort of focusing now and into the future. And the research in this area was almost non-existent in 2010 and is now proliferated rapidly. So there's lots to learn about. ACRL has been busy at work. They conducted summits with higher education uh, leaders and provosts and, and, and chancellors and whatnot. Um, and then did the assessment in action project. And hopefully a lot of you are hearing terms and phrases that you're familiar with. So this has been an, an arc of interest um, in our profession. Um, now they're looking at ways to expand what we've learned from this, this progression uh, in other ways so to deliver professional development to, to more people in lighter weight ways than maybe an entire commitment to assessment and action. Uh, they've got a new research agenda coming out this spring, so it's still moving forward in a, in a big way. And in some ways, the, the first image of the value report was like a drop in a puddle, right? And now I think this, the next uh, cover, and Marianne, I'm glad you're here, it should be a fire hydrant because it's really expanding. And I think what that demonstrates in its relevant circumstation today is the interest in documenting the impact of the library on student outcomes, student learning, student success, however we define that. It's a little bit different on different campuses. So that really completes our arc up to the, this position. The next stage, I think, and again, we don't get rid of any of the rest, keep pull up your plate, I believe is learning analytics. And paying attention to what's going on in our areas, of, in our institutions of higher education, this does not indicate that like each one is significantly better than the rest, but that all of these things are sort of, it's like more of a time evolution than improvement. They all have damning weaknesses, they all have great advantages. So there's not like, you can pick out one and go with that. There's all of these things are complementary. Okay. So I alluded earlier to the need to clarify what do we mean by learning analytics for at least the purposes of this conversation and what do we mean by library analytics. And I think what um, a lot of librarians might be talking about right now in terms of learning analytics actually ends up being what we had to define as library analytics to make forward progress in the conversation. And what I mean by that are the sort of correlation numbers that we've been talking about. So the students come to the reference desk or participate in instruction or check out more documents. What does that mean for GPA retention and so on? And that's the, the beginning of this you know, larger thread in our research. Um, but it's not the same as what our institutions mean when they say learning analytics. They're related but not synonymous. So if we move instead, for the rest of today, to an institutional focus, the library within the larger institution, um, I want to use this as our working <coughs> definition of learning analytics. And it's, it's not new. It's the one that keeps being cited over and over again. So there's nothing like really inspiring about my selection of this definition. But I think it's clear, and I think it works. The measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. So to some degree, you could say that library analytics is a part of that, but that's not really what the rest of higher education is thinking about when they're pushing forward uh, in their progress of learning analytics. This chart, and also the one on the next slide, because I couldn't decide between the two, I liked them both so much, um, shows a progression of what the, the institution considers learning analytics, what they're talking about when they talk about this, starting with descriptive analytics, which describe what's going on 
in terms of what's happening with our student populations, who's succeeding, who's not, and then trying to figure out why that's happening. That would be the diagnostic stage. So we're kind of in the bottom left-hand corner right now in higher education generally. Moving in, everyone hopes, to greater emphasis on the predictive analytics predicting what might happen so that we can swoop in and intervene. If we can figure out where there are problems in the curriculum, we can <coughs> instructional improvements. If we can figure out where students are struggling the most in terms of their coursework, we might be able to intervene with those at-risk students. So trying to, to be helpful with the data we, that we have rather than just sitting on it. This is a really fun chart too. And it says basically the same thing but with a little bit more detail. In all cases, I would say, and Malcolm might disagree with me, but I would say um, we're sort of below that bar going across. I think most of the things that are on the higher level are sort of future, and things that are underneath that bar I think are more current and even sometimes um, a little bit aspirational. So what's going on? Where is it happening? How often is it happening? Where is it happening? Uh, what's the problem and what do we need to do about it? And then the next the future, in this, in this area it would be above that bar, mostly. Now, the goal of learning analytics is not um, to gather more data, but to do something with the data. The goal is to intervene or take action. Now, that might mean setting policies or coming up with procedures or staging, um, staging interventions. That makes it seem really confrontational. I think we need a different term. Um, but you know, interceding on students' behalf to help them learn. Sometimes these interventions might be passive, uh, might get a notification, um, they might be active, asking students to go meet with someone at tutorial services if they're struggling in a writing course, maybe meeting with a librarian if they're starting, struggling in a research-based course, um, or something where the, the, the library has the right data set or whatever, but connecting all the dots within the institution actively, getting students, ideally a nudge and not a kick in the seat of the pants, but moving in the right direction to be helpful to the students. Uh, also, ideally, we want these interventions to happen more in real time, finding out at the end of the semester what happened. It's a little too late for some portion of students if we were focusing on at-risk students. Um, finding out even a couple of weeks you know, past when the problem is occurring for many students, if something, the bottom falls out of their funding or their, their personal lives or whatever and they stop going to class. Um, waiting two or three weeks might be irretrievable to get them back on track. So we want this to be as close to real time as possible. And also I would just add here that when you're taking actions or making interventions from learning analytics or planning to do that, I think that those actions and interventions should be judged not based on how many students did we send to tutorial services uh, or how, how many faculty members did we help with the place in the courses that their students are getting stuck, but rather what, what did that action actually result in? Do we have more retained students? Do we have students getting better grades? Do we have students reporting higher satisfaction? What have you. So where does the data come from in these systems, generally speaking? Um, they come from places that we, you know, we already have data, but um, they're being brought together in a new way. So um, the student information system, that was usually historical or static data, like social economic status, um, high school GPA, uh, SAT scores, that kind of thing. Learning management systems, whether those are being used for online courses or campus courses, but there's a lot of click-through data and activity data in those systems that can be drawn into um, a learning analytics system. Uh, information from publishers, like what students are doing with their new textbooks. Um, clickers, videos, surveys, even how often students are going to um, the dining hall. Do they stop eating? Are they eating too? <laughs> I don't think they report when you're eating too much. Uh, I'd sign up. But, um, or, you know, if they stop going to the gym and they kind of establish a pattern, so something's going on, maybe their advisor needs to know. Or maybe they don't. Maybe that's an overreach. We need to talk about this. Uh, the, the, why would we want to bring all these things together? Well, mostly it's for pedagogical purposes. Mostly we're looking to improve the curriculum where students are struggling. Where are the trouble points in a given course or in a given path to degree completion or program completion? Um, all right, if at-risk students are struggling, why are they struggling? When are they struggling? What can we do about it? Um, <coughs> so I prepared a few notes because I didn't want to forget anything. Oh, this is an also really important one. 
helping students become more aware of their own learning, so a metacognitive role. So if they, in places where the learning analytic system is open to students, which many of them are, they can see when they're starting to maybe fall off or go from a green light to a yellow light or a red light. And so that also helps them, be, oh wait a minute, something's going on. My faculty member, my professor is realizing that something's going wrong in my, my grades or whatever. And it's actually, got, I've gone from yellow to green to yellow. I need to do something about that. So thinking about those um, and having the conversations with their advisor as a result. And then also I think we need to acknowledge that that has a small focus in terms of individual students. It also has a large focus in terms of our institutions. And that means also a business purpose to keep students retained, to get into completion with their programs and their degrees. Um, you know, those, are, those are educational goals. They're also business goals. And so the two things are, are sort of together. Now, like I said earlier on the, the slide with the arc, all of the approaches to assessment and student learning improvement and student, student success have advantages and disadvantages. And I want to acknowledge a couple of this rather significant uh, areas of concern as well. So one of them is organizational culture. There are lots of institutions, and my friends seem to work at all of them, where people say that they care about data-driven decision making, but they actually don't walk that talk at all. And so more data in a culture that doesn't uh, use data to make its decision is really not all that helpful, right? It needs to be actionable. I, I was at uh, an uh, ACRL um, Value Summit years ago where Charlie Blake said, um, you know, you can have all the, all the survey results, all the data you want, but if it resides in binders or on someone's, you know, H drive, it's not actually being used and that's, that's pointless. And, that, and actually a good way to kill an assessment effort as well. Um, so organizational issues are really an important area of, of concern. And also, if your campus is like that, not helping them, not being part or around the table when issues are hashed out and concerns are hashed out, I think there's a place for libraries at that table in terms of lots of different areas of this. Of this um, am I over time? No. Okay. Uh, or this, this movement. Um, I think librarians have a lot of skills to bring to bear, whether it's understanding when students struggle and you know, intervening in their, their educational or understanding how to use research data or having you know, professional ethics around the use of data. So there's a lot of things that we can bring to the table to help with the organizational culture issue. Also, data, right? So uh, you need to have good data, complete data, data that is uh, protected, data that is uh, used properly. Some of the systems, uh, when you talk about learning analytics are homegrown, some of the systems are vendor produced. And so when you have um, systems that aren't homegrown, you might have questions around um, proprietary or the closed nature of some systems you need to be able to understand because you may have to someday defend decisions that you're making based on data. And you don't know how that's coming out of the system that's a problem. Um, I, I am not an expert in data quality, but lots of people are in data quality. Let me say that. Okay. Data period, quality period. Uh, the cohorts, if you're looking at small cohorts, particularly for at-risk sorts of things, small cohorts that we know in research can lead to sort of spurious information if you're not careful. So you need to be careful when you slice and dice down the areas where you can identify people or that your, your data is actually um, not high quality data because you've you've cut down to such a small population that what your what the results are are not um, legitimate. I think also it's worth saying, and I've been talking about this in the in the value construction, but also learning analytics are at least currently built a lot on correlation rather than causation as well. So looking at how things correlate, that's not the same thing as causing it. So you could tell a student you need to have these five behaviors and they tend to lead to more success, but you can't say you do these five things and you will get an A. So understanding what to promise, what to not promise, you know, that, that's a really important part of the process as well. So Malcolm and I are going to take a moment, um, starting now, to talk about different types of learning analytics systems that are present and are developing in higher education. I'm going to show you the two easy ones, and I'm going to make Malcolm do the hard stuff. Um, but I'm really excited about what he's going to talk about. I want to talk about something that's kind of uh, referred to as an IPASS system or an integrated planning and advising system. And these are rapidly uh, proliferating across our campuses. Um, Malcolm's going to cover some of the more developing areas. One of them, I think a good uh, first example of, and some of you may be familiar with course signals at Purdue. It was created there. It's now um, part of the Aleutian product line, so it's, it's now a vendor supply. But um, the idea here is that 
students um, and advisors have, and I believe also faculty, have access into modules that show, I was er earlier referring to green, yellow, red, um, with customized notices and automatic notices to students about what's causing those things. Probably don't need a customized note about, you know, uh, not attending, but some things require maybe faculty or an advisor to say something specific. Uh, there's, I included these links, not because um, they make for a beautiful slide, but because these are, when I was learning about this myself, these are the, the places that I thought gave you the most information, quickest, <coughs> the least amount of time, right? So uh, high impact links to learn about this sort of process. Syracuse has also, uh, what my institution has also bought into a version of this, it's not this version, uh, but we're, they're rolling it out with our undergraduates this semester, uh, graduate students I think either next year or next semester. Um, so it, this, is, this is happening a lot and fast. There's another example of slide that I wanted to share with um, what's going on at the University of Michigan where lots of great learning analytics work is happening. Um, this is a screenshot from their uh, system that is used for advisors so they can at risk, uh, identify at risk students using learning management system data. But if you want to learn about more about this kind of thing, also following what's going on, um, Timothy McKay and others at the, at the University of Michigan are great ones to watch. And he tweets, so you can pay attention to that as well. Okay, so the ones I just showed you started out homegrown, but there are lots of others as well. I also wanted to just uh, acknowledge a few um, pioneers in our own field who have been uh, doing this kind of work. The University of Wollongong in Australia is different from um, US institutions in that they were the early adopters of using data to look at student success and then goaded their campus into it. So that's kind of fun. Um, but the, the other examples here are not exactly that, but they're really <coughs> progressive um, in terms of their, their use. And I, I believe, based on my conversations at the Library Assessment Conference, that this slide is going to fill up pretty fast. Because there are lots of campuses that are just getting involved in this. And their campus might be involved in the Learning Analytics Initiative, but the library now is. Um, Scott Walter standing in the back, looking very dapper with his plaid tie, um, and he can talk to you about what's going on at DePaul in terms of the library's integration uh, as, a, as a point of um, intervention for students who are struggling. At Texas Tech, uh, Laura Hines sent me a little, like three or four sentences I wanted to read to you about what they're doing there. She said, uh, I asked for subject librarians, the personal librarians, to be included, and they were able to add them to the list of tutors so they have access to the system. Advisors and faculty are able to refer students to the librarian for assistance. Students are able to make appointments using the system due to the capability of syncing with outlook calendars of the librarians. Librarians are able to leave comments for the faculty and also able to push out notifications to classes reminding them to set an appointment with their librarian for research assistance. This was just lost this, launched this semester. Faculty and students are slowly adapting. The reporting feature I hope to be able to use in the future will allow me to look at the students who did meet with their librarian for a course and their final grade in the class. You can see how this is starting um, to work out. The University of Minnesota um, presented on this at the Library Assessment Conference and all their presentations are available um, on the web. So I won't go into detail on that. Okay, how, do I, how am I doing for time? I'm over, I'll come go. Thanks, Megan. All right. Um, so what I would like to do in my segment is to come at this from a slightly different angle. And by growing in on it from a different angle, I think you'll find that we're ending up in exactly the spot that Megan just brought us to. So what I hope to do is show some thinking that's coalescing about digital learning environments in general on our campus. And so put a spotlight on the opportunity that exists, why it's opportune now to be thinking of learning elements on an institutional rather than on a side of the scale. Okay. But first, this is an academic meeting, so there's a quiz. All right, class, play around. This flag, what is it the flag of? It's supposed to be the terms. Anyone know? This is the flag of Esperanto. And I'll get back to Esperanto while I'm talking about something black in Esperanto in a moment. So what I'm going to describe is some research that we've been doing at EDUCAUSE, did do at EDUCAUSE, uh, with some money that we got from the Gates Foundation. And these are the two reports we produced on it. There's a little URL down at the bottom. You can, you're free to grab these reports uh, if you're curious about them and want to hear about them in some more detail. Um, 
So the question was from the Gates Foundation, what does what should the next LMS be? What should it look like? What should it do? Uh, you know, whether it be LMS two, three, or five, or LMS five hundred and twenty three. Um, but when we started off with this research, we quickly came to the realization that um, that's the wrong question. Because whether it's LMS 10, 25, 537, you're still in this box thinking about the LMS. So we felt that there's no single application out there that can possibly address the diversity that you see across all the post-secondary education. So the, the wrong question is, what should the LMS become? So we decided that this notion of an Uber application that LMS sometimes is seen as in terms of the digital learning environment, again, it's the wrong approach. So we decided to cast them on the side. And we came up with this name, which is fairly hideous, but you know, something that I guess only us framers could love. So we call it the next generation digital learning environment. It's next generational in terms of trying to get away from people relying exclusively on the LMS. It's digital because the digital infrastructure and our digital environments enable everything that we do. And it is a learning environment, and not just a learning management environment. So that's why we came up with the same with an even more hideous uh, acronym was the NPLE. Okay. So what we are now thinking that the right approach is is what we call component architecture, so that you bring in a variety of digital componentry to allow faculty and students to scaffold, bring together, and create the environment that will best suit and support the learning and the teaching. So that might mean, in some cases, um, that you have an LMS augmented by a series of applications. It might mean that you have an LMS that is so kind of covered over by these augmenting applications that you really see it's not really that forefront in the user experience. It might be playing a background role, but it's not the main user experience. Or you could have uh, no LMS at all, just a framework of applications. So our report, our thinking is entirely agnostic. We're not saying that one of these is better. What we're saying is what we need is to have the mobility to construct a framework that will support our learners and our instructors. So what we're really espousing is openness and an openness based on standards, and open standards. So that's why we were using this Lego metaphor, and that's why there was that Lego picture at the beginning. So Legos, as you know, allow you to build almost anything you would like to build as long as they are they adhere to a certain standard. Um, this is the actual specification. So as long as the little pegs adhere to these standards, you can build something like this. You can build whatever you want to build with pieces that can be of any shape or size. As long as they adhere to certain standards, you can fit them together to suit your purpose. We're, we're thinking that is the best way to approach this. So why, that's why there's this sort of Esperanto idea that's certainly in the background of all this. And now with respect to learning data, um, it gets even better, I think. So in our thinking, we identified five functional domains that we think that this next generation environment needs to address. So now there's this focus now on the uh, first two, which is interoperability and learning analytics data. Okay. So right now, learning data is largely siloed. We have it from a variety of sources. It could be the LMS, it could be the student information system, it could be from all over the place. And the fact that this data is siloed is one problem. The fact that it's all recorded in a different language, like one might be free from a language, <coughs> is another problem. So what we're thinking is, is that if this remains where everything is siloed in, in sort of a different format, trying to come together and form a larger set of learning data is going to be like arm wrestling. It's going to be a very, very hard process. It's going to be very easy to get discouraged. It's going to be very easy to remain from siloed and speaking different languages. So the idea here that's emerging around the, cal the caliper standard is that of something that's called the learning record store. And this is at the heart of two very important standards around the review. One is XHPI, which is sometimes called CPAN. The other is the caliper standard from IMS Global. They both have this notion that what we want to do is integrate a reservoir or depository of our learning data, have it all in the same language, have it all in the same location, so that we can then invent analytical engines 
to make use of the data to improve our learning environments, improve learning experience, and promote student success. So that's the core of the idea. So this is a graphic from the XAPI site. Again, you have students having a variety of experience using a variety of componentry. Why not be able to gather all the learning data from all those various components, have it flow into a reservoir, and again, so that you can have a much more detailed, integrated picture of what the student is doing. Caliper is talking about the same thing, the same standard from uh, uh, IMS Global. They're saying, look at the variety of experiences and tools that the students are using. Wouldn't it be good if they all spoke the same language so that you have this learning data in one repository? So that you have, on the basis of this interoperability, you would have, you enable innovation and also feed insights. So now let's look at a few campuses and what they're doing. So let's go to a few campuses around the gate. We had a session at the last EDUCAUSE conference. I'm just uh, shamelessly borrowing slides from that session. Let's first look at what UC Berkeley is doing here. And you probably can't read this all too well, so I apologize. But what we can see there on the left side is a variety of applications. And by means of the CalPOR or XAPI open standards, they are feeding data into our learning record store that again makes it available to uh, analytical engines. And they are out of the gate in terms of designing the record store. This is some technical detail. We can make these slides available so if you're interested in the detail, you can uh, grab it then. Um, I'll skip through this for the sake of time. Um, they are also thinking about student agency and privacy. They have uh, a number of privacy principles already in guiding their use of this data and their collecting this data and this aggregating of this data. So they've been doing some thinking about this. And they also have some recommended practices. So they not only have a collecting the data, they have a series of practices around it to guide their use of it. The University of Kentucky has been working on Linux for a good number, two, three years now. And again, so if you think about in the old days, if you were, say, approaching this from an IT perspective and say, now we need to integrate uh, this into one of our central administrative applications, if you have to integrate these all by hand, it's an immense amount of work, it's an immense amount of expense, and then when either one of the two changes, either the central host system or the remote application, if they change, you have to do integration all over again. So that's why these standards are so important, because they will eliminate that cost and that loss of time and allow you to be able to make these connections much more effortlessly. Same thing about a learning record store. Again, if all your ancillary products are using or talking this Esperanto learning data, then you can they all deposit it effortlessly into the learning record store, and then it's for available for use by the institution uh, for its own strategic purposes. So again, they're talking, talking in the exact same way. A variety of applications all speaking the same language, depositing this data in a single location so that it can be made use of in a strategic sense. So the caliper, I won't go into the details of the caliper, but it, it essentially, the nice thing about it is, is that it is designed to capture learning data and it is extensible. So the set of definitions and expressions in the caliper language, if you will, is not separate and can be extended. So, that was a quick tour. We're going to now go into a discussion portion. So, Megan? The markers are much better at the time. Okay. So, what we wanted to do is really hear a lot from all of you uh, and sort of facilitate you guys talking to each other, but then also report out to the larger group so that we can all have a free and fun and not at all, you know, fraught with peril conversation about this new uh, initiative on many of our campuses. And really, we wanted to start you off with sort of a general question, which is, what's the library's role with respect to institutional learning data and analytics? What is our role? What could our role be? What should our role be? Um, of course, that, pre that assumes my perspective, which is that we should have a role. Um, so maybe you can push back on that as well. So what I want to ask you to do is to turn to your elbow partners, uh, the people near you, and if you don't like that person, turn to the other side. <laughs> And uh, if you need to move, please do that as well. And I want you to engage this question. Mark's like, 
um, engage this question for a little bit, and then we're going to ask uh, for different people to report out and to get, get the, everything going. But I wanted for you know some of us are introverts, and we need to like reflect and then talk small, and then we'll talk big. Sound good? So maybe about seven, ten minutes to talk small with your your partners, and then we'll report out and discuss it. So just a couple things so I know it's time. I wanted to just point out a few way, places where you can learn more. I know they're going to uh, be sharing these slides. So um, my GA very helpfully uh, selected out of the huge uh, annotated, bibliography, annotated bibliography she's done four resources that are great starting points. Um, I've left actually two uh, handouts in the back if you want to grab one. We're also going to be talking about this at the ACRL conference. Um, uh, one presentation that's uh, all librarians and another one where Malcolm is going to reprise his role as well as um, some others on the panel. I'm really excited about moderating the, the, these discussions. And also um, Malcolm has uh, contributed some continued here reading. So if you're at the next stage, you know, you're, you've already started and you're at the next stage, here are some additional things you can think about as well. Okay, so I want to thank you guys all for coming. We can stick around and talk, but I want to also release you because I think we're eating next, right? Yes. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>